G'day and welcome to this week's Midweek Message. The title is God's End Time Timetable, Predictions Near and Distant. And it's a follow-on from Alan's lovely message on Sunday, which included God's timetable among the Thessalonians. Today we are rooted in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, and we're going to let the Gospel speak for itself. So from, from verse 1, As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. Jesus replied, Yes, look at these great buildings, but they will, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? So about 15 years before the birth of Jesus, Herod the Great began to remodel the second temple, which had stood for some 500 years since the time of Ezra and the exiles returned to Jerusalem. Why was Herod upgrading the temple? Was he doing it to please God, to worship God? No, not at all. He was doing it to appease the Jews whom he was ruling over at the time. So Jesus makes this impressive near prediction that in AD 70 the um, temple will fall and indeed, indeed it does. So Jesus um, dies around uh, dies AD 33. So some 37 years later he predicts that the fall of Jerusalem will come. So that's the near prediction and then are also distant predictions. Disciples alive at the time then of the fall of Jerusalem would certainly have taken note that if this happened, then what Jesus said about the distant predictions was certainly also going to happen as well. The uh, temple itself was only completed around AD 64, so a massive building project by Herod the Great. So what Jesus' response then to this question, when will all this stuff happen, is a blend of further near and further predictions, the near ones related to the fall of the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70, and the distant ones about his second coming. That's why we're calling it God's end time timetable. So then verse 5, Jesus replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place. But the end, so that's a, a near and a distant prediction, won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. So a near prediction towards AD 70 and also, of, of course, predicting for, for us today regarding the second coming. There will be what will be taking place. There'll be many misleading deceivers claiming to be the Messiah, um, claiming to be true prophets, and they are false prophets. There'll be wars, threats of wars. There were then, uh, just after Jesus' death, right through to AD 70, there will be uh, the same thing is happening today earthquakes, famines, then and now. And all of these, of course, only birth pains, like the expectation of a baby coming, but not yet. Verse 9, uh, when these things begin to happen, watch out. So now we begin to see the purpose of the writing. Not about trying to predict when Jesus will come, putting it on a calendar date, but rather how should we live in this time in between, uh, waiting for his coming. Watch out, you will be handed over to local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell others about me. For the good news must first be preached to all nations. But when you're arrested and stand trial, don't worry in advance about what you will say. Just say what God tells you at the time. That's not a, a kind of a, a let off for preachers or those who are preparing messages about Jesus. Uh, we're still supposed to do our proper pre preparation. Uh, this is about persecution. So I've got a very clear picture about what will happen um, prior to the second coming. Of Jesus and also prior then for them to the fall of Jerusalem was the fact that there would be an increase in persecution for followers of Jesus. Persecution will always be an opportunity to share the love of Jesus 
with those who persecute us. And don't worry about your defense. Uh, same as those who are facing this today. We know we live in the age of the greatest persecution of Christians around the world. People are, being, are suffering for their faith in massive ways. Back into the text, verse 12. A brother will betray his brother to death. The father will betray his own child. And the children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So, again, a near... Prediction for the Jesus followers who lived then, who heard him speaking prior to the fall of, of Jerusalem and the temple, AD 70. And the same for us, a prediction for us as we wait for the second coming. What will happen? There'll be some hostility in homes about faith. There'll be some division about faith, about those who say they follow Jesus and those who are not. Families will be divided and even betrayed. So how were they to live? How are we to live? The text says, for the one who endures to the end. Well, so, so faithful endurance. The very same message that comes in Revelation. This, Mark 13, is sometimes called the little apocalypse, which is a kind of language, apocalyptic language that is used. And the same kind of language is used in Revelation, which is the grand apocalyptic um, revelation. The same message in the book of Revelation. Each of the churches... Faithful endurance. Those who faithfully endure will overcome. You will overcome in Christ. He is faithful. Such an encouragement. We're back into the text. Mark 13 verse 14. The day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration. Standing where he should not be. Read and pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of the roof must not go down into the house to pack. There's no time for that. person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. No time for that. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter. For there will be a great anguish in those days than, than at any time since God created the world. And it will never be so great again. In fact, unless the Lord shortens the time of calamity, not a single person will survive. But for the sake of his chosen ones, he has shortened those Days that would have been relevant to the build up to the persecution uh, prior to the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, the blood that was running in the streets of Jerusalem with the persecution of the Roman emperors, and of course, the increase in persecution until the return of Jesus. We see it in our world today uh, this increase in persecution. What about the sacrilegious object that is spoken about? The desecration. It is, in fact, referring to the desecration of God's holy place, the temple, the altar, the place of worship or places of worship uh, by unholy people who are God's enemies. And this, in fact, has happened many times during Israel's history, going as far back as 597 BC, before Jesus, before his birth, Nebuchadnezzar looted the temple and took Jews captive to Babylon. The temple was desecrated. 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes, a horrible character, he sacrificed a pig to Zeus on the altar in the temple, an unholy enemy of God. 70 AD, same thing, when it fell, Roman Emperor Titus put an idol on the burnt out site of the temple. So we should expect more of these kind of things prior to the second coming. What does the text say? Therefore, you know, be ready. Uh, no delays. No looking back. You know, don't be like Lot's wife looking back about, you know, my life in the old world, my pre-Jesus life. No, it's about living faithfully for Jesus. This is the purpose of the text. Friends, so verse 21, back in Mark chapter 13. Then, if anyone tells you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For well, false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform signs and wonders so as to deceive if possible, listen to this, even God's chosen one. So, it's possible for uh, believers then, uh, you know, in the 37 odd years, when Jesus is saying this prior to the fall of Jerusalem, there'll be false prophets, deceivers, you know, performers of miracles, false stuff, and even God's chosen people. It's possible for believers to be deceived. So, the text is saying, watch out. Be careful. Don't get sucked in by that kind of stuff. Then and now, false prophets, false messiahs will perform signs and wonders 
shallow believers can be deceived. Let's not be shallow believers. In fact, this whole text is an invitation as God reveals his end time timetable to deeper discipleship. The way of the cross, the way of sacrifice, the way of loving Jesus in difficult times. This is the antidote. Deeper discipleship is the antidote to being deceived. We are not to seek the spectacular, to seek the signs and wonders. Um, don't be a signs and wonder seeker. Don't elevate yourself to an, kind of an exclusive club Christianity. In fact, this whole passage is the exact opposite to today what we call a, could call a kind of triumphalistic Christianity or a prosperity gospel. How far away from all of that is the reality of this? Following Jesus through persecution, trial and suffering and difficulty before the end. Verse 24, back in Mark 13. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is the God of the cosmos, the God of the universe speaking. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory and he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones. So comforting for those of us who faithfully seek to follow Jesus. We know that at times we're unfaithful. We're sinners. We fall. But he is faithful. We believe in the Jesus who is faithful. Who reinstates Peter. Who loves Mary. Who, who, who loves the, the, the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Who are confused and running away. Turns them around back to Jerusalem. We believe in this Jesus, the resurrected Messiah. So the second coming is the opposite of the first coming, which took place in the obscurity and the, the quietness of the, of, of the um, stable, the cave, um, and to his second coming. Don't, don't worry that you'll miss it. If you're a true disciple or a follower of Jesus, he will be on display for the cosmos. The universe, all people will see him and know him. It'll be terrible for unbelievers. But it'll be magnificent for believers. The whole text is pointing point to faith and hope and love for faithful followers of Jesus. And um, verse 28, back in Mark 13. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout. You know that summer is near. We know God speaks from his creation. There are seasons. And in the very same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return, so now we're getting into a distant prediction, his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. That's a near prediction for those when Jerusalem is going to fall. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. So a lesson from the fig tree about giving fruit in time and in season. We look at it. We know God made the fig tree. We know God will let it blossom in his perfect time. The same thing with the fall of Jerusalem, he knew when it would happen. He's warning his disciples about them. Don't get excited about these wonderful buildings. Don't get excited about massive, impressive church buildings today. It's about a living faith in Jesus, not a triumphalistic, uh, miracles, signs and wonders seeking kind of faith at all. Verse 32, however, no one knows. Listen to this. I mean, <clears throat> how do people misread this? How do the false prophets misread this? It says, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Of course, Jesus knows now. He's in heaven at the side of the Father and the Father and the Son and the Spirit of the One. But in his humanity, he um, gives up his divinity. And so he says, you know, only the Father will reveal in his perfect timing when the Son will return. We say me to that, friends. Sure. It's not about predictions and trying to put it on a calendar at all, is it? And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard, stay alert. So again, the purpose, the near predictions for the approaching fall of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, the approaching coming, the second coming of Christ 2,000 years later, I mean, how embarrassing is it, all the predictions and then the reinterpretation of times and events? The text is clearly saying that's just silly. That's shallow, immature Christianity. Mature Christianity is about a deeper, faith-filled 
discipleship that endures, that loves in joy and persecution and lives for Christ in the middle of COVID, anticipating his second coming. Don't give these false prophets a voice. Don't listen to them. Don't give them a platform. Don't send out their messages on WhatsApp or your Facebook, etc. Let the living word of God speak to you. Friends, stay alert. Verse 34, the coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story. Here's another illustration of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeepers to watch out for his return. You too must keep watch. There the word is again. Keep watch. Be alert. For you don't know, there it is again, when the master of the household will return in the evening, at midnight, before dawn or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you, what I say to everyone, watch for him. Stay alert. That's our purpose. The slaves are giving given work. So prior to um, the fall of Jerusalem, the disciples, the follower of Christ, had work to do for Jesus, to live for him, to make a stand for him. Their, their, um, their whole lives were to point to him. Our work, whatever we do for him, he is our ultimate employer, is to point to Jesus. The same as we today live in anticipation of the second coming, the, the distant prediction, we are to do the same. We have work to do. We have a life to live, a faithful endurance to follow through on. The lessons from this man who's gone a long, long time. It's now 2,000 years since that near prediction. But he spoke also about the distant prediction, which we don't know when he will return. But the whole text is encouraging us to stay alert, to have a, a living, a vibrant, loving faith with Jesus, to love his church, not to love the buildings, um, to maintain them, of course, but um, not to love them more than we love him. The buildings, everything is to point to Christ. Our lives to, are, are to point to Christ. We've been entrusted with work, so we're not to be complacent or to compromise while we wait for him, but rather to be alert. So in summary, friends, with that near prediction and the distant prediction, whether it is 40 years to the fall of Jerusalem, whether it was 400 years into the future, or 4,000 years, which you know bypasses us, what should we, what should they be doing in their years? What should we be doing in our years? Well, don't be misled by speculative claims or speculative predictions, because that's all they are. They are speculation about the end times. Don't be threatened into silence about not sharing your faith because of the culture of the day that wants to silence our voice of the true believer. You know, silence the speculative predictors, but don't silence your voice, your story about you following Jesus. Do make a stand for Jesus. Do share your personal story. Be alert spiritually, morally, psychologically. Anticipate the second coming. Don't let him find us sleeping. Don't let him find a sleeping church, but rather an alert church. This is an invitation, friends, to a deeper discipleship in the midst of increasing persecution, quiet persecution, subtle persecution, or major persecution. Don't be surprised in the increase of persecution. Are you making plans, things about temporary things in life, important things, you know, weddings, births, career opportunities, your future? That's important. But are we taking time to make plans for the second coming of Jesus? Father, help us, we pray. Help us to stay alert. Help us to uh, follow this invitation to a deeper discipleship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, friends, until we meet again.